Well, we're live, you know. Let's get started. I'm yeah. Chris Reddick. I got Tim J Johnson. I can try that again. We'll just start over again. Cool. I'm Chris <laughs> Reddick. I got Tim Johnson over there across the interweb. Uh, we're here with For Love of Code and Ready, Set, Go. At 3 a.m., you get up and you, uh, you know, you're trying something out. How often does that happen? Because I read an article recently that uh, I'm going to bring it up here in a second. But uh, <laughs> how, often, how frequently are you doing it? Um, uh, I don't, I don't have a fair answer for that. Cause sometimes I'm working just too late at 3am is inconceivable that I wake up, but I mean, occasionally I do wake up in the middle of the night cause I have an idea or something has woken me up. That's caused me to have an idea where I'm like, Oh, I gotta go write this down. <laughs> All right. So the article How am I wrong? Read is, uh, 19 little known programming myths. And number one is that good coders work around the clock. So <laughs> you, I agree. I agree. Yeah. You have, you have blown a hole in this argument already. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I confess I have, um, I have fallen into that category at times. I, uh, but I don't like to do that if I can avoid it. There are times where I will, you know, I'll go late into the night because I just can't let things go. But generally I try to, and especially now that my, my days start very early with no commute and uh, end very late with no commute, um, it, it's very easy to fall into the trap of, uh, of working extended hours and I have to really focus on keeping a, a, a little bit more rigid schedule. Yeah, I, I know when you and I first started working together, um, you know, one of the guys on my team was big into, um, you know, making sure you didn't have developer burnout. And really, he he kind of introduced, he, he would kind of champion Agile in a way that I had never been exposed to. Um, and we had one of those, one of those old guys on the team that was, he was def definitely a butts and seats and you know, if it takes you 14 hours to do it, you need to sit here and do it for 14 hours. And so him, the project manager and the and this developer were constantly clashing because he could throw up 10 different articles that would say, hey, this is a bad idea to run your to run your team this hard. Now, I understand, like, if there's a deadline that you guys are trying to make, I mean, you don't want to burn everybody out. Um, so, you know, you got to. You got to, uh, maybe I look at it as like a Tesla with a, with their batteries, you know, you could, you could run a ludicrous mode, uh, but your battery's going to wear down really fast Yeah. or your life, your life. Yeah. Your battery life, finish, you know, suffer. Or you could, or you could do the long run and, and get, I think I just read an article today that said that they're now a 400 mile, 400 mile range now. Um, right. With so responsible driving habits. Right? Exactly. Exactly. So <laughs> You know, like I said, I mean, on a on a one off basis, but you can't be that shouldn't be the expectation that people are going to work extra. I mean, that's the whole reason, you know, we do sprint planning and things of that nature. So you kind of figure out, hey, here's what we're going to do in this block of time. Right. Um, right. What's a reasonable amount of work that we can get done? Yes. In the time that we have for it. Yeah. All right. Let me run. Let me run through the rest of this thing. I got a lot of them. Uh, offshoring leads to cheaper, faster software. Um, I'm going to say it depends. <laughs> uh, but the next point they also make is offshoring will destroy your career. And, um, you know, that, I think those go hand in hand. Um, they're offshoring is a really attractive idea for a lot of companies because of this, the perceived savings. And I think that's what number two speaks to. Um, but you I really kind of have to think about, um, you know, the, the big companies have um, probably picked up, this is general generalization, but the big companies have probably picked up the best offshore workers. So you're getting, in general, probably the second and third tier offshore developers. And that being said, uh, you really got to uh, project manage the crap out of your offshore team um and i've had some experience doing that um you have to be and you have to um you got to be really tight on uh your expectations uh you you know you have to have some really well-defined requirements 
and your software development process has to be dialed in because, um, you know, offshore developers in general, again, are, their job is to get a job done and damn the torpedoes, they're going to go full speed ahead, <laughs> regardless of, of what's in their way. Would you agree with that? Yeah, that's, um, yeah, I, I use the term work package. Like you need a well-defined work package and you need to have several of those stacked up. So you end up spending a lot more time. You end up spending a lot more time getting them uh, work to do than kind of doing work. I would say it's kind of a, a shift to kind of go to your other, to your third, your third question or myth or whatever um, that you, you spend a lot of that time uh, kind of making sure they have all the right answers because uh, they don't generally, at least my experience is they don't generally ask questions of, hey, are we sure we want to do this this way? Um, you know, they, you send them in a direction and, and there they go. Um, <laughs> whether it's the right direction or not, that's the direction you sent them. Um, so that feedback loop might be a little, uh, maybe a little difficult. Um, but overall, I mean, overall, I, 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 um, I don't like once you, I mean, you said it level of expectations. I think once you get, once you get that, um, expectations uh met um i, I think you, and you understand how that workflow uh, is supposed to go they can produce um they can produce things well um but again you've got to have all that all that stuff together ahead of time um and then still still i don't know that it's it's like like a junior programmer like as cool as you think they are or as good as they are you still, there's still some, you know, trust, but verify, uh, kind of mentality. So, I, um, I agree with that. like while they are getting things done, like, you, you know, it said faster, um, they, they do seem to be cheaper and it does seem to come out faster, but then how much do you have to go back and, and massage it and tweak it and make it conform yeah. to your standards? And I think it's, it's even in here, uh, you know, there. I think a myth is that you can replace a senior developer with two junior developers. Like it's it's the same uh, misguided uh, mentality that um, you know uh, volume will somehow uh, get a job done faster. And in reality, you can have too many cooks in the kitchen, or if you have a bunch of inexperienced cooks in the kitchen, whereas one steady hand kind of knows how to efficiently work through a process, uh, you, you know, it's, 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 it's an uninformed um, debate that I've heard brought up a lot by a lot of project managers. You know, how many, and this is my pet peeve is, how many resources do we need to to make this happen? And can can we get a bunch of junior resources? And it's, yeah. it's one for me, like calling me a resource is almost inflammatory. I I hate that more than anything else because um, me and my team are not just uh, things that you can go over to Best Buy and pick up off the shelf. You know, we are <laughs> we 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 work really hard at, at um, you know, making sure that we are uh, craftsmen and to just be referred to in the same sentence as a piece of uh, computer equipment is, you know, not really taking into consideration, you know, the, 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 the love for the thing that we do, which is, you know, really why, why we have this, this podcast too, is to kind of share our opinions about that. Um, Let's see. The more people checking, the fewer the bugs. So we have a system right now that uh, does some some static code um, um, reviews for us, and we'll we'll go through and try to identify as many um, known programming bugs as it can. Uh, there's no substitute for kind of the semantics of of code, um, but I would I would agree with this one in that uh, having more people doing code reviews isn't necessarily going to find more bugs, uh, especially the way code reviews kind of 
have been done, at least the way I've seen them done in the past 10 or 12 years, is um, you're only looking at the diffs, right? So would you agree with me on this one? Like when you're only looking at that small window of, of the differences between the code old and new, it doesn't give you kind of a broader perspective into, well, who calls this code and what's the result downstream of this code? Uh, you're only really seeing the, um, you know, the, 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 uh, the, you know, the, the change that as it's happening in the micro. Well, yeah, I mean, frequent, frequently we're deleting code and you're like, well, did you just delete folks? Right. Did you just delete <laughs> functionality? Did you move it somewhere? Like, I mean, you really, there's more than just looking at the diff that that's, that's required. Um, and definitely what was the, what was the, what was the thing? More people checking. Um, more people checking yeah. means fewer bugs. Given yeah. enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. Yeah, no. <laughs> I feel like I feel like you know the the code the, the automation tools that we have it's, as far as like checking that that's that's really the the key is you know human beings suck at at that kind of stuff um and then repetitively you know at some point you get drained uh just trying to look at the same thing over and over and over again oh yeah um, it'll be right in front of your face yeah. and you just won't see it. Yeah, if anybody's done anything that's missed a semicolon or something like that, or you know, for for those that do uh, like Python and stuff, if you've missed an indentation, good luck finding that. Yeah. <laughs> and there's where your that's where your IDE uh, can co can come into play to help you out for those things. I would say the tooling is more valuable from a programmer's perspective than a code review is. Yeah, having great tools, the code I think, helps review. you for me is like the the last check it's like hey is there something in here that i just because i've been too close to it i just can't see it and you take a look at it and you're like hey why are you doing it this way and it's like i i literally just didn't even notice because i've i've been looking at it for so long it's it's, it's like camouflage yeah most of the time my code my code <clears throat> excuse me my code reviews are focused on kind of intent and, fu and functionality, not not, not necessarily yeah, I mean, worried about. Uh, that's a good point. I mean, you and I, we use code reviews more for like educating our teams than we do for actually finding bugs. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Uh, number, number five, and I call BS on this one, math skills determine coding skills. Um, I have a math minor. I don't know why. Basically, I needed one extra class and I got a math minor for free. So I took it. Um, uh, but I do not use my math at all. And at any time, I've only had one time where I needed to do math and I walked down the hall and asked a senior programmer, a guy who loved math, how to do it. And he just gave me the formula and I programmed it in. Um, so m computer programming in like, uh, the 1970s was very, I guess, math intensive or born out of math but I don't see how they're still um, even being mentioned in the same breath anymore. Yeah. Well, the term, <clears throat> my understanding of the term Lambda is a math, is a math term. So, but yeah, I don't, um, I haven't used what I would consider math uh, for anything heavy. I mean, usually if you're going to need some math stuff, for example, um, you know, I know we've, we've got on projects that do, um, lat longs and want to determine you know what's the nearest and you got you can't just look in a circle well that's math yeah but you gotta look you gotta look at a yeah but you and you gotta look at the the concept of a sphere so that changes your your ranges and things of that nature but those two those two things you know the the power of google <laughs> can yeah, be your friend this has um been reasonably well solved I don't know any time in the past 20 years yeah and I, and I feel like some of that stuff is so hyper specific for you to be a math uh, you know expert is going to be um un, un, unhelpful unuseful um right i mean i and think now we're, we're, we're generalizing sure. yes i mean you know obviously there are there are folks that work in like modeling and simulation where you know they they probably do a lot of math yeah. But in general, we do business dashboards. You know, we're more focused on like revenue goals. So, yeah, that's just we're not we're not in that space. And I wouldn't say most people are. But I mean, having 
you know, you should understand math. I mean, you should know what, like, how to, how to formulate an average and maybe like even, you know, do, you know, like some standard deviation to, you know, on, on for data quality, but I can't, now, you know what I wish they would teach? I wish they would teach it even at the high school level, do a whole, whole class on Boolean algebra, just mm, being able yeah. to like, you know, work through true, false and, and not cases. Yeah. Um, I think we'll, we'll go into that here in a minute, you know, what, what it takes to be a programmer, but knowing and understanding Boolean algebra is like paramount to, to programming. Um, and I taught at the university level for a few years and I can, I can tell you in the programming classes that it was, uh, less than an afterthought. So, um, it, I, I feel like there's a major hole when it comes to, uh, the education system. Uh, we put way too much emphasis on, um, SOLs. <laughs> Well, don't don't get me started on standardized tests, but you know, just um, you know, I, I don't feel like education has kept pace with the industry, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get into that here in a minute. Um, developers are geniuses. I can Absolutely. certify that we are not. Whoa, hold on now. I'll dispute that. <laughs> I can certify that I am not. Uh, Tim, I you know. Uh, hey, I wear I wear slip I wear slippers because I don't know how to tie a shoe. <laughs> um, you can specialize in just one thing. So nope. yeah, there there are specialists. Um, we'll do, we'll do a whole episode on this one. Um, there are specialists and there are general generalists. Um, we seek to employ at, at prime three software we seek to employ generalists because we uh do a lot of project-based work and we're bouncing all over the place and i can't justify hiring a person that only knows how to write cobol code <laughs> using that as an example <laughs> and you look at the you know the, these COBOL programmers are like coming out of the woodwork and they're like finally my time has arrived but it's like what have you been doing for the past 40 years waiting for this moment to, to you know come back into vogue um yeah there's in my opinion there's very little room for specialization now tim you're better at some things than i am at some things and that's that's just putting together a good team. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the things, so to, to use your cobalt example, imagine if you're a developer and you only know cobalt, well, you're only ever going to write cobalt and you recognize that, well, you should be able to recognize cobalt's I'll, I'll use the term dead, but it, it's not long for this life anymore. Whereas, whereas, yeah. Whereas <laughs> if, if, um, if uh if you were a programmer that knew cobalt and say java you could actually then now begin to think of ideas of hey i know the, the organization is moving the java route and i know cobalt fairly well but we can start trying to bring business logic from the cobalt and put it in java and then you've now you've now helped your organization migrate to newer technology Having having been able to to be what you would term like say a generalist or whatever, but I mean that's that would be the the biggest benefit of why you would want to not specialize in one play, one specific area because I mean everything's going to change. Um, you know yeah. what, what we were, you we'll know, say it over and over again. If you're not if you're not evolving in this career, you are getting left behind. Yeah, because even the thing you did two years ago is now out of date. Well, just look at Angular. Ang the right. ang Angular one was a thing. Um, its big claim to fame was the, the was that um, oh gosh, the being able to change something on the fly. Uh, uh, the name is now escaping me. Um, but they from 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 version one to version two, like it was a complete paradigm shift. Like if you can't, 
they actually had to write interpreters and stuff to even do conversions from one to two. So, I mean, it's in it visually, it's a different language, looks a different language. They're using TypeScript versus JavaScript now, um, those kinds of things. And that was in the span of about six months that they started that. Um, so, and then now people are saying, you know, they're Angular, but it's really Angular JS. And that, that technology is, they're no longer even developing that anymore. And that happened at the, you know, at the blink of an eye. Like if you could, yeah, if you would have read an article that was a little dated, you'd be like, Hey, I'm doing this angular one thing. And they're like, Hey, we're on angular two and four. And you know, what, what are we up to now? Nine. I think they're getting ready to release right 10. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> that's how fast it happens. Um, well, and I think organizations and we'll, we'll, we'll hit on this topic another time too but organizations really need to pay attention to their strategy for keeping their software up to date because yeah we look at that i mean uh angular is up to nine it was on you know it we started with it when it was in it was going angular two and we hit it on its beta and that was only three years ago four years ago and i mean now it's a completely I and mean, even what's in nine is um, not compatible with what's in what was in two. Yeah. So, you know, when you look at an organization, you know, they have to kind of consider keeping their stuff up to date as well. And and the life cycle of the code should include staying up to date with the code. Otherwise, you're going to be searching for specialists and I can certify to you that specialists are far more expensive than generalists. Yeah. <laughs> you will pay a premium to find those few people across the globe that can still support your busted architecture. And I can guarantee that these organizations didn't factor that into their cost savings when they decided not to stay modern. Yeah. All right, keep going. Uh, Number eight says language X is better. So making the argument that one language is better than another. And then the next one is pretty close to that. You can master a language in a few weeks. So, um, you know, we have opinions on things that we like, but would you say one language is better than another? Absolutely. Java is the best. Followed closely Fair. by TypeScript. Um, no, I mean, I, I really feel like you're, you're, if you have that opinion, then I feel like you're, you might be doing something wrong or your worldview is very narrow and small um, because, you know, there's no, I mean, the languages exist for a reason. Um, somebody felt that, you know, they could do something that's slightly better or it's very specific. For example, Go goes, you know, its reason for being was to, from my knowledge, to to help prevent uh, memory leaks and stuff for all these buffer overflow attacks that that were happening uh, for a period of time. Now, is that your best framework for um, for writing a website? Probably not. Um, you know, uh, then you got to look at uh, you know availability of, of personnel to kind of go back to your other one, generalist versus. Yeah. You know, it's yeah, it speaks to the, the principle of, you know, if, if all you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail, right? Yeah, yeah. Sure, you can you can nail that board and or you can hammer that board in half, but a saw would probably be the better approach, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't, I, like, I have a preference, um, and that would obviously be the ones that I know. But, I mean, I do see as new ones come on, I'm like, ooh, I like that feature. Like, I like some of what I've seen from Go. Um, I've experimented a little bit with Python, not a fan of the indent, but there is a lot of the, uh, the, um, syntax and stuff that you, that, uh, like, I, I like you being able to traverse the string backwards just by using negative numbers. Um, pretty, I don't think Java supports that. Um, so it's like, uh, you know, uh, searching, a, searching a, an array backwards and things of that nature. Um, there's a lot of stuff that Python has just like built in that you would have to write a library or depend on some third party library from a Java perspective to do. Um, so, I mean, I think they all have their pluses and minuses, um, except C, C sucks. I think I can agree. I think I can get a lot of people to agree with that. Um, well, I mean, that's, again, that goes back to, you know, is there a better mousetrap? 
Um, you know, have we evolved past COBOL? Have we evolved past C? Sure, there are specific applications where that might fit, but, you know, there might be abstractions around that as well that, you know, unless you have a very specific reason for using it, you know, maybe you don't need to remember how to do C programming. Yeah. I wouldn't say, I'd, I'd like to understand what mastery means because I don't, I don't know that I'm a master of any programming language, but I probably know, I've probably written code in 20 programming languages. Um, and even when I was teaching, you know, I, I, I'm even, my, my youngest is programming now, he's 10 and he's programming in Scratch. Uh, are you familiar with that? No, you had mentioned it to me before, but that's about yeah. as much as I know so, about it. So Scratch come, came out um, from MIT. It's a, uh, it's a visual programming language, but it's designed to enforce constructs. So um, you visually will create like a loop and it's, it's, a, it's a block that you drop into the screen and then you put your statements inside the block and you can see they're all connected together. Um, and he's, he's now writing, he calls them video games. He's now <laughs> writing, um, you know, programs and it's, it's, it's very visual based, uh, but they have them, um, they have them integrated now with like Lego Technics and stuff. So you can, um, you know, build robots, same exact programming language, but he, you know, he's putting visual things on the screen, you know, they're flying around and he clicks on them and they, you know, they accumulate points and yeah, I mean, he's effectively written a game in a visual programming mm -hmm. uh, construct. But he, what he doesn't realize, I'm like, you know, I start using the terms with him and he's able to converse with me about the programs that he's written. He's like, oh yeah, when I get this, when I get a click and I'm like, so you, you're, you're getting an event, right? And he's like, yeah, yeah, when I get that, then I add to this. And I was like, so you're incrementing this counter. And, you know, the other day he was telling me about the variables he was setting. And I think <laughs> like a little tear, a little tear <laughs> down my teeth. It's like a really really beautiful moment for me but i would say you know he had no programming experience a month ago he spends an hour a day five days a week tinkering you with whatever he learns on youtube or on the the, the scratch uh, main website and he's learning constructs and the constructs are generally portable across languages yeah so at a certain point if you know how a loop works, if you know yeah. how a conditional statement works, take that with you to the next language. So that's the first thing I'm looking for is, all right, what are the differences in the syntax? Yeah. Okay, so this is how I write the thing that I already know how to do. And for me, switching between languages is actually pretty trivial once I understand the rules around how languages are written yeah. because I already know how to write programs. I just need to learn to write them in this new language, yeah. figure out how they're structured and I'm off to the races. Now, is that mastery level? Probably not. Is it passable? Probably so. And that's how I'm able to really um, keep evolving as a programmer as I'm going forward. Well, is it Tim Ferriss that came up with that 10,000 hours thing? It says to be a true yeah. master, you gotta be, have 10,000 hours. Yeah, I don't know if that was his. Repeat that. That do you have to, that it takes 10,000 hours to be being actually considered a master at something. Um, right. And I don't remember who came up with it, but I, I'm, I'm the firm believer of that. Um, that the closer you are to that number, um, now in a couple of weeks, yeah, you can be proficient. Um, but, you know, yeah, I mean, from a business perspective, I, I bill my customers, let's say, roughly 2,000 hours a year for um, you know a full year worth of um, someone's time. So to say that they were a master level programmer, that would be five years of of development, um, you know, to get to a mastery level. Now I don't do five years worth of Java programming. I don't do five years worth of uh, website development or any, any given thing like that, but that speaks to, uh, the breadth of the services that we offer versus the depth of the services that we offer. Yeah. Uh, number 10, I don't understand, but, uh, there's a, a software crisis and I'll read it. Uh, 
Edgar Dijkstra talked about the software crisis in 1968, which referred to building software that was inefficient, over budget, low quality, and difficult to maintain. Today, the fact that buggy software costs the U.S. billions of dollars purports the crisis, although there's no real crisis to speak of. Software isn't doing too bad, it's always improving and commands a large chunk of the economy. It commands a large chunk of the economy while moving at, at lightning speed. And there will always be hiccups in efficiency as new software emergency is as new software emerges. No need to panic. The crisis is a myth. Um, uh, you know, <laughs> it, quality is is one of the tenants that, of our company. So um, we we really try hard to avoid um, putting buggy code out into the world, but it happens. I mean, the there are so 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 many things that can go wrong in a modern piece of software um when you're talking about uh 50 60 upwards of 70 thousand lines of code for something that i would term as a medium-sized program you can't tell me that you know something hasn't been introduced inadvertently now we we ascribe to um a, a test first or a test driven um methodology we don't always write our tests first, but we write tests and that's more than a lot of our competitors do because um, we're, we're, we make that part of our development process so that we're sure that um, with some degree of certainty, the, the code that we're writing is uh, completing its objective and any changes in the future don't sway it from that objective. Yeah, uh, the, yeah, I mean, the once the several things that are I've we, are we facing a mountain of buggy code? Do you think? Um, uh, maybe. I mean, maybe it's un un. Um, I would you haven't found wager, you haven't found them yet. <laughs> I would wager we're facing a mountain of unsecure code. Uh, that's absolutely the case. Especially as these um, smart devices are coming online, we're finding that they've just been slapped together. And security yeah. was an afterthought. Uh, I think I think people who are seeking to specialize in an area to focus on cybersecurity would be, you know, and secure programming standards would would um, you know if, if you want to take if you're trying to figure out what course to take, take that one because yeah. uh, knowing how to write secure code is is going to continue to pay dividends and and probably grow your career faster than than other things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I mean, that's definitely a clear. Um, we're not getting rid of that anytime soon. No. Um, like there was, a, there's a specialty now for data scientists. But the more articles I read, the more that is becoming unclear that machine learning and artificial intelligence isn't going to kind of consume that that uh, path or that track um, at some some point in the future. But security is definitely here to stay. Um, but as far as like uh, uh, the in crisis, I mean, one of the things that I that bothers me about some of this some of this stuff is a lot of people push code out. Like Google's one of them. How long was Google was Gmail in beta? Like ten years. Um, so I mean, they, they almost got the bugs out. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, it really comes comes down to like kind of expectations, and I think you know from a from a IoT perspective. You know the the producers of these of these Internet of Things, you know these wired refrigerators or uh, uh, and those kinds of things. They push them out without the thought of 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 security, without the thought of of uh, upgradable path, things of that nature. That they're like, hey, I just got to get this in front of people. It's like the sooner I can start making money on it, the better off I'm going to be. And so they make some assumptions, right? So I mean, they don't start with security; they start with the application they're building. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, and then they make assumptions like, well, you know, we don't have to have super strong security on this device because, you know, the home network will be secured. Okay. Um, maybe. Uh, I can guarantee I could probably cruise around my neighborhood and find Wi-Fi that's using the default password. I mean, that's, yeah. so, so we've, already, we've already broke that one. Um, and then, you know, well, we, we ran out of time or we ran out of budget to, to you know, to get the application done. So, you know, uh, we'll, we'll focus on security in the next round and it's always gets pushed off till the next round and the next round. I mean, that's a, 
there, that's a that could be a whole topic of its own. Yeah, but as far as like you know bugs and in that nature, I I think the focus is always get something out quickly. You know, like an MVP, minimum viable product uh, style solution. So you don't, it's not fully baked. You haven't factored in all possible cases. So I mean, bugs are sent unknowingly. Um, it's rare that somebody sends out a known bug and they're okay with it. Um, but that is also possible. And some of the stuff I feel like the people that might have made the comment are coming from the perspective of, you know, they use the term software engineering, I think, to lump it in with some of the standard like architectural or, or electrical engine, you know, these standards in engineering things that are actually that are actually uh, like they're concrete uh, uh, mechanisms to, in place. I mean, they're they're based on physics. Um, and I've heard routinely that software development um, is more of an art form. So, you know, if you're if, if you're if you're producing art, there are going to be flaws um, there that you, you can't you can't spec out the, the bugs per se. But um, to, to say that it's a high degree of of, of uh, costs and things of that nature. I mean, I, I can get behind that bugs. I forget where the article was, but it said that 80% of software, the cost of software is maintenance. And that would oh, leave well, that, you're that on the next one right here. So when okay. you ship software, you're done. That's the next move. <laughs> nope. Um, so, so we, we off, we operate in the, uh, agile, uh, um, methodologies. Um, and so with that, we have something called the definition of done, which is, uh, it's important. It's an important concept to understand as a developer is like what what done means to people. Um, you know, for for example, like my kids when they say they're done done with lunch, and it's like, well, yeah, you're done actually eating, but you still have your plate still on the table. The dishes haven't been cleaned. You know, you haven't thrown stuff away. So, understanding what that done what done means. So, um, a while back, I watched a, a talk by um, one of the lead architects at Netflix. And they said that their definition of done is when the code is no longer in use and that is done. So with that with that one concept in mind, that kind of blows this myth out of the water that it's not done until it's no longer in use. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've worked on projects that are, you know, in their 20th year and they're still gonna be used for, you know, 10 or 15 years past my time with it. So, I mean, that's, What's the total cost of ownership for that? Yeah. That uh, you just hit on the next one, I swear. Uh, coding <laughs> is simply the act of writing code. And it's, there's so much more to it than, I mean, you can write code, but I don't know any people who like, you know, just sit down, write code and then chunk it over the wall and it's somebody else's problem. I've never been anywhere where I haven't had to wear multiple hats, either like a, a DevOps, a developer operations type, uh, capacity or, you know, I had to focus on getting the product to production. I mean, it's, I, I've, I've been to the field, I've done installs. Um, I, I, I don't know what I would do if I just had to write code. That would be, um, that would be bizarre. I have written, I have been to one place where I wrote code. They've since changed the, their methodologies and it felt icky. Um, well, because you, you got this requirement you weren't in on any of the meetings that gathered the requirements just like hey build this and then you build it and then you throw it over the wall to for to a qa department that then checks it and then they report back to you whether it passed or failed and I knew a guy who used to drive trucks right out of college or no before college uh, he was trying to figure himself out before he went to college and his nickname as a trucker was nitro because he used to drive um he would go to uh go to work at the nuclear power plant, he would get in the truck, fully loaded. He would drive it from point A to point B. Then he would get out of the truck and get in another vehicle and they would take him back to his car and he would go home. And that was his only job was to drive like oh. nuclear waste from somewhere to somewhere. And then that was it. <laughs> wow. I mean, maybe if that's your job, yeah, sure. I can see it, uh, but I don't, I've never been in a place where it's been like that. I kind of want to know why am I doing this? Why? What's the, you know, okay, I, I'll, I'll take your requirements, but I, I feel like maybe, maybe there might be a different way to do this. And, you know, I kind of want to have a hand in, 
have a hand in getting it out. Yeah, uh, absolutely. You touched on this one too. Uh, coding is not a creative field. I mean, I think it's completely a um, an art form, and it, there's there's a lot of different ways to solve a problem. And the minute you think even the even the elegant solution that I wrote last week um, isn't as elegant as the as good as um, you know. On, it's not as good as I thought it was when I look at it a second time. I'm like, oh man, I really could have done this better. And I, you know, I, I can come back to code, uh, three or four different iterations and make modifications to it each and every time, and still, you know, I'm gradually trying to improve it or look to improve it in a new and better way. Yeah, I, I've I've routinely like looked at code and just keep looking at it, going, it's good enough. And this is one of the favorite sayings we've been tossing around lately is perfect is the enemy of, of good. Um, but I mean, I keep looking and, and art. Um, one of my, one of my backgrounds is in art. Um, and so that was always one of the things you continually look at. You're like, Hey, I can, I can add a little splash of color here. I could do a little bit something. So it's that's always, a heavy, that's a heavy eye roll for me. I was, uh, Oh my gosh. Yeah. Right there. You, you got that one. Yeah. So I, I just, it's, it's a constant, it's a constant just tweaking and can I make it better? And, it, you know, and then you read articles that introduce new topics that you're like, Hey, I hadn't thought of it that way. Let me do this. Um, but I mean, a perfect, perfect example of making something better. Um, and there's probably a better way to this. And that's one thing that I'm very cognizant of is the solution I have today isn't necessarily the best or the only way it, it's a way. You know, I did solve the problem. Um, but lately, a pattern that I have been using, um, if you're trying to uh, make sure you only have one of of a thing is to use a hash map. Um, you know, if you're looping over, if you're looping over a, a, in Java, if you're looping over a list and you want to make sure you only have one and only one of something um, based on some other criteria, use a, ha use a, a, a map. And that way you can just grab it. And then at the end, I mean, that's its sole function is to have one and only one key. But that was a, that's a relatively new pattern uh, for me as a developer. Because um, prior to that, I would, I would do a, hey, here's my current value. Here's my, here's my previous value. And here's my new value. And then just to slowly like drop these things into a list and I'd have to hold three, you'd have to hold three pointers in, in, in place. And then, I don't know, somewhere I read an article that said, Hey, use a map. And I'm like, Oh, that, that just, that changed my entire world. But I mean, you, you get to see like, Hey, that's a, that's another way to solve the problem. And it seems more elegant. But you wouldn't have found that if you weren't, you know, continuously keeping up with your craft. Yeah, right? that's I'm, true. You, you would have either, Maybe you would have seen it in a code review. I learn a lot from code reviews. I learn a lot from our um, our static code analysis results. But uh, if I was just a heads down programmer, like you know, I'm focusing on just solving problems. If all I again to that analogy, if all I have is my hammer, yeah, I mean, I'm never gonna never gonna grow. I'm just gonna continue to develop code at this level. I might get a little faster at making it, but it's never going to get any better. And it, that's that's on the developer to continually kind of uh, evolve with the industry. I'm going to skip 14 because uh, I think that's that's the my most critical. Um, number 15 is uh, developers think managers have nothing to contribute. What's the best manager you ever worked for? Uh, you no. Um... Uh -oh. Probably, pro probably Craig. Um, that uh, Craig knows his stuff. He, well, yeah. Well, I mean, he's a he's a technologist, uh, you know, as well. Like very, very much believing in that there's other ways to solve the same problem and giving you the leeway to figure that out. And they, you know, they're not dictating to you how exactly you need to do your job. Understanding that the work product is is the is the right metric to look at um whether you're sitting in the chair or not um you know just having that measure and then not not throwing you know artificial metrics at you like you know having 
so many lines of code written or you know so many defects that you've uh, not introduced those kinds of things you know let you encourage you to 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 grow as a developer and go seek other other uh, ways to solve problems um, you know just not confining you to any any one solution recognizing again the work the, the product at the end is the thing that the business is is in need of like the business doesn't care whether what language you use the business doesn't care you know what whether or not you're an expert in math or how smart you are that none of that matters it's hey did you give me the thing i asked for um and also do that in a in a timely manner so uh yeah those are all the kind of traits that i look for in a good manager yeah i think the best ones that i've had have been have had technical experience or were so close to the product they knew the product inside and out that um that they you know even though they, they didn't write the code they they knew how everything functioned and they had a very clear vision for the future for how they wanted it to go together and um they might have been you know the, for you you can overlook a lot of faults but you can't really overlook um ignorance and that's either intentional or unintentional ignorance because i we know we know people who don't want any part of that technical stuff, but they still need to know the product that they are responsible for. And um, if if you aren't taking ownership of the thing that you own, then you're not doing your team any service. And now your team uh, is going to your team is in a bad situation because they're coming up with solutions but they have no measure of success because the direction that they might be headed isn't the direction that management has in mind or comes up with downstream and suddenly well you guys did it wrong well no we did it the way we thought it ought to be done in absence of clear direction yeah and there's a difference there and i've been places where you know, we've had to kind of write our own script and for better or worse, we got the work done, but did we really get it done? Um, we're never really sure because we, we you know we didn't get the requirements. We didn't get that, that kind of hands-on ownership of the product that we were developing and we took ownership of it, but our vision obviously isn't the same as you know, somebody in management, uh, somebody I would refer to as more of a product owner. So I would mostly say that management, um, I've been plenty of places where they brought nothing to the table. I've been some places where they brought a lot to the table. Unfortunately, it's more often than not that management has not provided the support for development teams that I've been on and projects have suffered as a consequence. The upside of that is I learned how to be a really good project manager because I saw these pitfalls and kind of had to live through them on the other side. So I tried my best to not fall into those myself and you know offer advice where I see uh, people going astray. Yeah, you have to manage the managers. <laughs> and that, you know, sometimes that happens. Oh, number 16, young developers think they're hot shots. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think I'm a hot shot. I, um, I've never heard that. No? <laughs> I mean, I guess, uh, I don't, uh, yeah, I've never, I don't think I've ever heard that. Um, I most, most junior developers or whatever kind of come in feeling like they don't know everything and they, they I feel like they communicate that. Um, in a way I've of only okay, had a few who, who really thought that they um they were you know they <laughs> the, the trick with that is uh if you don't come in humble you will become humble very quickly yeah because uh, the the work will humble you <laughs> and um so you know come in uh you, you know you land that first job just recognize that you have no idea what you're doing even us as experienced programmers, it might take me two years to understand a code base. 
two years and I've been on dozens of co new code projects. Now I can usually if they're structured in you know a fairly decent way, I can find my way pretty quickly, probably faster than somebody who's new because I've you know been on enough projects I kind of know some of the ins and outs. But to truly understand a program, it takes just a long time. And I realize that and I'm, I'm, I have no, no illusion to say that, oh, yeah, I can just look at it and I'm going to I'm going to know everything that, that this thing does uh, in a week. Um, and so I, I don't know, I try. I know that I I know what I'm good at and I know what I'm not good at. And um, I uh, definitely try to stay humble as much as I can. Yeah, I, I, you know, even today, it's, I, I know I don't know everything. And I'm, I'm very willing to listen to anybody, uh, regardless of their talent, their age, you know, anything, I'm, I'm open for business as far as learning new things. Um, and I feel you, like that's a key you, trait. You pointed something out to me, you know, one of your pet peeves, you said was, uh, what, what, what happens when somebody starts pointing to their resume? Yes, that. Yeah, when you start trying out your resume, I've been doing this for fifteen years. That's that's never a that's never an argument for your point. <laughs> um, you know, if your way is good, it should show up that your way is good. Otherwise, it might not be, and you should you might go on to look at some other uh, from from a different perspective. So, yeah. Um, I mean, young young developers are are no different than developers are no different than people. You know, you're going to yeah. run into cocky people you're going to run into humble people you're going to run into everything in between yeah um i you know i'm, I'm on the other side now i'm hiring people um I, i'm looking at personalities at this point i'm looking at um you know are you are you a hard worker are you going to come in and um you know do what's expected of you are you going to do you know above and beyond what's expected of you are you going to buck the system and you know even though we asked you to do it one way you did it another way because you felt like it not because you have a you know a justifiable reason you know we've we've seen all those pitfalls um well it goes I, back to those previous traits we talked about in our last podcast you know being humble having a sense of humor being resilient yes. um being have a passion you know those are all the you know you, you can kind of get the you can gauge those during an interview to figure out like where you are and i've right. you know based on, going back to what you were saying earlier you know if you understand those core concepts of what a develop what uh programming is you know like understanding what conditionals are and loops and hash maps and all those fun stuff i mean you can teach somebody else a different language but i mean if you don't if you don't have that 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 base um you know it becomes problematic so you say uh a myth is that programming is boring so uh and then number 18 is a developer's career is over at 35. both of these hit home <laughs> we, would, we, would, we would categorically say um these, these are incorrect <laughs> i don't think anything um, wakes you up at 3 a.m in the morning trying to solve something is boring because you're bored with it yeah um, now I would say you're, you're, you know, if you've been doing development as a career for, you know, let's say fresh out of college to the, to the time you get to be 35, you're not going to be, unless you go down this path, you're typically don't, you're not just a programmer at that point. You've, you are morphing into, um, maybe a, a broader term would be like a technologist or an architect or an enterprise application developer. Your your you have your value is is um, in your ability to look at the solution in its whole. You know where is it gonna where is it gonna live? How, you know how is it gonna live? How can we support um, you know uh, our users at scale? Will this thing scale with the business? You know you you're starting to take looks at things besides solving you know your small programming challenges you're 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 usually stepping out to uh focus on the bigger picture items and i would say you know let, let's assume that 
at, at your, uh, at 35, you would have, I don't know, let's say 12 years in the industry. By that age, I would assume that you're able to lead a team. I would assume that you're able to, uh, kind of be a force multiplier. So, uh, we'll, we'll do a show on this sometime. I read an article about being a, uh, a 10 X programmer. So your one programmer is worth, uh, the value of 10. Um, I would say at, at, you know, 12, at 12 years in the industry, you've got well over 20,000 hours of experience. Um, you should be bringing a lot more to the table than just somebody who can sling code. You need to, um, you need to really show value in being able to develop solutions. And I'm talking solutions that are ready for a commercial, um, commercial usage. I'm talking hundreds of thousands of users. Uh, and this, this would go out to, uh, being able to, um, you know, think about, think about problems that are bigger than just small, you know, programming problems that are in one specific area. Yeah. And that point too, you'd also be a mentor. Like, definitely. I mean, you, you definitely can't hoard that knowledge and, and think that's all you're ever going to have to do. So, I mean, yeah, none of, <laughs> if 35 is a cutoff, I'm, I'm hosed. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> We're out to pasture. Yeah. Sorry. It's over. We're just cruising to our, uh, to our social security checks at this point. Uh, number 19, I touched on this one. Developers are a commodity. Um, again, you can't go to Best Buy and pick one of me up. Um, it, it, and, and if you, any organization that thinks you can just, uh, plug and play, you're going to pay, uh, you're going to pay the price for that. So number 14 says developers have poor social skills. And I would say the number one thing that you can do is work on your communication skills, because if you can't articulate your ideas and hold a conversation around ideas you're you're not going to be able to be as effective you're not going to be able to take in information and and share information you're not going to be an effective um uh teammate you're not you know everything starts with communication and there's um we see it all the time. Uh, developers want to be in a dark room, uh, heads down on their program. They want to, you know, headphones on, you know, just focus. And I get it. I, you know, it's, I, I do it all the time. I, I go into, into the cave and I work. Right. But inevitably I'm going to run into the problem and I need to reach out and phone a friend and say, how, how do I solve this problem? Well, what's the problem? I have to be able to describe where I am. I have to be able to um, articulate what the issue is. I also need to be able to talk with customers, my users. I need to be able to be an effective communicator with them. So even if it's, um, uh, you know, getting requirements from my customers, if it's on a support call and they um, they're having trouble using my systems, I need to be able to one, be polite uh, to write, you know, a well-written email that, you know, is free of grammatical errors. Three, be very clear about the thing that, uh, that I'm asking about, uh, you know, remove any ambiguity around, um, the, the very specific problem because they're, they're coming at this from, um, you know, being very close to the solution. You're coming to this from being very close to the code. You have to be able to kind of translate, uh, their problems and your solutions to, to kind of come to, um, to some sort of agreement so that you can work on these things. Um, I think if you can't be an effective communicator, uh, you can, you know, before you go to a code boot camp, before you sign up for your major, before you, uh, you know, are looking at your graduation requirements, think about taking, uh, we had to take a public speaking class. Yeah. Um, you know, a simple exercise could be just walk down the street and make eye contact with people and like give them the head nod. You know, it's, it's being able to, um, being able to communicate effectively. It shows more business value to me and, you know, I think that would be uh, where I would start if um, if 
if I was looking uphill at, 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 at this as a career? Um, I mean, yeah, those are all, those are all fair. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm remembering some of the interviews, uh, when we were, um, hiring at my last job where on paper, somebody like I'm looking at their resume going, Oh my gosh, these, this person's a rock star. Um, this, I, I, this person's going <clears> to, <throat> excuse me, supplant my position as the like senior developer and things of that nature. And then they get in and they, they can barely get a word out. Um, and it's like, okay. And then you ask them about their projects and they can't quite, you know, speak to them. And it's like, I, I don't know. I like, if I can't talk to you developer to developer, how can, how can we communicate to our business? You know, um, you know, one, one of the important things I, I, I find myself having to be able to do is translate what I call what I would call like nerd speak into biz, business speak because you know the the business that you're building something for isn't necessarily going to understand what a server is um, or what an application server is or what a for loop is or nor should they care they know they have a business problem they need a solution for they're going to give you as much information as they are capable of oftentimes they will give you a lot of use less information that you then have to be able to kind of you know call that information out into a, you know a requirement or or you know a, a project or something that that communication is going to be a, a fundamental uh, tenet and you know to go along with this thing saying they have poor you know developers have poor social skills I mean I would I would you know, I disagree with that um, in that, I mean, you and I talk all the time. <laughs> um, if you look at all these developer conferences and things of that nature, I mean, there's a lot of developers out there and they communicate well, especially with each other. Um, but being able to communicate to the business um, is even more, I don't want to say art form, but you have to you have to be able to live live in both both worlds, understanding when they're asking for X, and you're like, oh wait, that that means we have to do Y over here, and kind of insulate them from that sometimes, because like I said, you know the implementation details are are irrelevant to the business. Now, if they're asking for that, if they're more technical, or if they start uh, subscribing or prescribing uh, solutions. You know, sometimes you have to have a tactful way to say, hey, I, we'll, we'll come up with something and we'll present it to you. Um, you know, and public public speaking, I, I think, is uh, a big thing um, simply because being able to stand up at some point in your career, you're going to have to stand up and talk in front of people. And well, if you, would you say, um, all right, so let's say we have an open billet. We need to hire a uh, we need to develop uh, a developer. We're hiring a developer. Um, how? What makes a developer a good candidate? Um, I mean, going college over this. Uh, no, nope. I mean, I've hired people without college degrees. I mean, it goes back to the stuff we talked about last. Our last talk with the traits. What's your passion? You know, sense of humor, um, resiliency. You know, uh, what was it? Uh, uh, some compassion, understanding, like what's going on. Um, those kinds of things and an ability to communicate. I mean, though, all that kind of gets wrapped up. Um, like, I, I mean, I don't even care necessarily what language you worked. I want to hear about the problems you solved, how you went about solving them, you know, um, those kinds of those those kinds of attributes. You know, even talking with them, if they're like, yeah, I solved this and yeah, I solved that. And just just being able to if they come off as cocky and stuff, it's like, uh. I don't know. You got to work your way around those kinds of, of yeah. You can see through that pretty quickly from being on the other side of the desk. That yeah, um, you didn't solve that. Your team yeah. solved it, and you were part of the team. Maybe you didn't have hands on it, and we we can suss that out. Yeah, and then much. yeah, and if they're talking bad about the team and stuff, you're like, man, do I yeah. want? Do I really want this person on my team? If right. if they're not, you know, that team player is also uh, key. But that goes back to the social skills. You got to be able to get along with people. Um, if no one wants to work with you, you're worthless. No matter if you're the greatest developer ever, 
Um, no one's going to come to you with problems. No one's going to come to you with, with anything. Um, and I, yeah. I mean, we touched on it earlier. I think, I don't want to say you're only as good as what you worked on lately because, you know, the breadth of your experience certainly has value, but I don't really want to hear about that thing that you wrote 12 years ago. I want to know what you're working on right now and what did you work on? You know, maybe it's your last job or you didn't have a last job. What, what project did you work on in school that, you know, really excited you? Oh, you're not going to school. That's fine. What do you work on in the open source community? Like if you, if you want to be an attractive candidate, for us to hire, show me something, right? Um, it's It costs you nothing but your time and you get the benefit of learning and contributing to to join an open source project and just you know make make some commits to it. If, if nothing more, just learn how a project is structured. If you don't know how to write a single line of code, you can be a contributor, go on GitHub, find an open source project that you're interested in and contribute to the documentation. At least you know how to navigate a, a source code repository. You know what the um, what the check-in and the, the peer review process needs to be. You will have seen how a project is structured. I mean, that's those are things that I don't want to have to educate you on when you show up at my door. You know, you should. I I have a certain expectation that you will know how to commit code and go through a review and um and and get it you know into the baseline and these are all things that anybody can do with you know just investing a little bit of time and a little bit of education and i don't expect um somebody told me that uh, a college degree doesn't mean that you are trained it means that you are trainable yeah and to me that's been um you know once once i heard that the lights really went on i said yeah and I never learned anything in college that um, was directly applicable to any job that I've done. It just made me familiar with with different um, patterns and constructs. I yeah. would argue that my college degree isn't nearly as valuable as my first two years on the job. 100%, 100%. So that's it for today. Thanks for joining us. Uh, you can find us on forloveofcode.com. That's F-O-R-L-O-V-E of code.com. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. We are on Facebook. We are on LinkedIn. You can now find us on Spotify. We're working to get to the other podcast platforms. And we're on YouTube. Hopefully you can catch us on any and all of the platforms where you take up your media. We're going to try to cover them all. Uh, we appreciate you joining us today. Uh, again, we are uh, building this boat while it's on the water, so we're going to spring some leaks, but we appreciate you hanging in there with us. Uh, and we promise that we're going we're gonna to turn this into a uh, super fast racing boat someday soon. So again, appreciate you joining us, and we look forward to catching you next time. All right. See ya. Uh-oh. Let's see. I don't think it's